Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the today's Activity Strong webinar. Uh, my name is Meg Laporte, and I am on the Marketing and Communications team for Link Senior. Uh, for today's webinar, we are providing one free NAB, NCAP, NCCDP, NCTRC, and NZ SRDT CEU credit. To be eligible for the CEU credit, you need to remain on the webinar for the full hour. At the end of the webinar, I will provide you with a post-webinar CEU survey evaluation link in the chat box, and it will also be sent to you by email this afternoon, so please check your spam folders. If you have any questions, um, please email us at webinars at linkedsenior.com. CEU certificates will be issued by email before the end of the day on Friday, and you need to complete the CEU um, survey by midnight Eastern time this Thursday. And so now I will let uh, Charles de Vilmarin, our CEO, take it over. Thank you so much, Meg. Welcome everyone. <clears throat> Welcome for this Activity Strong webinar, um, success and lessons learned from resident engagement champions. And so talking about champions, I'll be formally introducing them, but I do want to welcome Amanda and Jenny. Thank you so much for being with us. You are true champions in the work you do, and I'm just very excited for our conversation to learn more about it and to share more. Like Meg shared, my name is Charles de Vilmarin. I am with, uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Link Senior. Activity Strong is this platform that Link Senior started to help elevate um, resident engagement professionals. And we do this with amazing organizations that include Activity Connection, NCAP and NAP. And I want to give a special shout out to NAP and its members because of the annual conference that is that has started yesterday. And I'll be flying to Minneapolis to give a talk there tomorrow. So very excited about that. But anyway, on point today, uh, just in terms of background, Link Senior, like I shared, is this company that we uh, started 16 years ago. Uh, we have strong and interesting and values that we really feel are important. One of them is obviously activity strong, which is why we're here today. And then the second one is this old people are cool campaign that we started a few years ago. And um, this morning I saw one of my kids walk around with an old people are cool t-shirt. And obviously, as you know, this always usually starts a really cool and meaningful conversation about elevating uh, the fact that aging is part of living. Uh, the company itself, uh, we are glad to touch the lives of 50,000 residents in the U.S. and in Canada. We work with amazing organizations that really believe in supporting their employees, their team members, to do what, what they love, which is basically to engage their residents with purpose. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that we are evidence-based. So this clinical study was published in a peer-reviewed journal in 2019. And if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out to us. So for today's session, um, I have to say that these are some of my favorite because we really get to hear from people actually doing the work. And um, and um, so the, the format is really conversation between Amanda, Janine, and myself. And so very excited to Introduce Janine Kinsey, who's the Vice President of Social Wellness and Life or Social Awareness and Enrichment with American Senior Communities. Janine, do you want to share a little bit about yourself and your organization? Yes, thank you so much for having me, Charles. And I think the last time um, you had me talk, I thanked you and I should again because Charles has been just a great mentor to me and a good partner in developing some of our life enrichment programs. So thanks for all your support. But I'm Janine Kinsey. Um, I work at American Senior Communities, which is an Indiana-based company that has a, a combination of skilled nursing facilities and senior living. So I get the privilege of kind of working with both of those areas and love it. Um, I put up on here my my best accomplishment, I think, and my absolute favorite thing is helping to develop um, with one of my friends who's our chief nursing officer, our care companion culture at ASC. And that really is, you know, prioritizing getting to really know our residents through learning about their life stories 
and making that a real priority in care. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit as we go through today. Uh, but I think it is absolutely the most important thing that we do um, is really find out who our residents are, who each other as coworkers are, and have that really drive the entire experience from life enrichment to our clinical services to social services. Um, I also uh, graduated from Wittenberg University, a really small college in Ohio. And as soon as I was done with that, went into long-term care. I did an interview this week and was talking to somebody about kind of why I chose this field. Uh, initially, I was all scheduled to go get my graduate degree and be a clinical psychologist. And I did an internship in a nursing home. It took me to some nursing homes and assisted livings. And I kind of can't explain what happened. It was just um, like a duck to water, really. I was so comfortable in that environment. I felt such a connection with our older adults. And I think they felt the same with me. It just all was very easy and just felt like I was coming home. And I always joke when I tell the story to ASC, that was a tough call to my parents to tell them that I wasn't going to go to graduate school, that I was going to go be a social worker in our nursing home. Um, but I, I have just loved every minute of it. And I told the person I was interviewing, you know, there's really no other population that I've worked with that so little effort on your part means so much to them. Um, you know, that they're not looking for a circus or a, a trip to Disney World. Um, they really just want someone to really see them, really know them, and really share an experience with them. So Charles, if you want to go to the next slide, I'll say a little bit more about myself. Um, but I live in a small town. It's actually the town that I grew up in, and I actually live in the house that I grew up in, um, in Noblesville, which is just outside of Indianapolis. Um, and I have two daughters who have aged a little bit since this picture. They're now 17 and 15. So I make sure to always talk about my dog because she's the only girl in my house who's always happy to see me and always <laughs> appreciates me. The other two, it's very questionable these days. Um, but I do oversee, I've got a, a mouthful of a title, but really what it means is I oversee social services, life enrichment, and memory care um, for our over 100 communities here in Indiana. And like Charles said, I do love Disney, so I'm excited for some of the upcoming events that Link Senior has. And I am a wine enthusiast, and I love going on vacation. I just got back from Disney about two weeks ago. And like I had said, I'm really passionate um, about learning and valuing other people's stories. It's my absolute favorite way to spend my time. Thanks so, thanks so much, Jane. I love the expression, Dr. Water. It does feel like that for a lot of us that fall in senior living and never kind of look back. Um, Amanda, do you mind sharing a little bit about yourself? Sorry, Amanda Yelenik, Vice President of Life Enrichment with Morning Point Senior Living. Uh, welcome. Do you want to share a bit more about yourself? Sure. Thank you. Um, so I have not spent my entire career in uh, senior living. I got my start in um, the YMCAs. So I worked for uh, actually two different YMCAs. And I actually had an aunt who had spent her whole career um, in senior living, just told me about a job opening that they had um, there at the community. And I applied for it and went through the whole process. Uh, and walked in it into it fairly blind. Um, I remember when I was leaving the YMCA, my boss at the time had said, "Oh, do you realize you're going to have to work with old people?" And I was like, I was shocked because I was really looking forward to it. Um, but I came in pretty blind, like I didn't know all the acronyms, and you know, there's there's a lot of different things that you have to to learn when you're there. Um, I came in because um, at the time our the company that I was working at was adding a position um, because they were partnering with a company called Masterpiece Living. Um, it, it's basically a company that supports a wellness initiative. Um, so we're focused on spiritual, social, physical, and intellectual growth for residents. Uh, and I loved working so much at that community. And I love the product so much that I ended up um, moving across the country to Colorado to go work for Masterpiece Living, um, which was the product that I'd gotten my start in senior living for. So I was there for eight years. Um, I started in more frontline position and uh, worked my way up to being the vice president of operations there. Uh, I decided I needed, I wanted to go back to uh, senior living community setting. 
So I applied for a job in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and here I am. So I've done a lot of moving around for my career. Uh, I, I I landed at Morning Point Senior Living. I've been here for two and uh, about two and a half years. Uh, we are building our 40th, 41st, and 42nd communities right now. Um, so we're in a process of, of growth. We own and operate our own communities. They are all assisted living and memory care communities, um, mostly across Tennessee and Kentucky. Um, I guess you can switch to the, ne the next slide. I, I grew up in Michigan, so I've been in a lot of states. Uh, that's where I went to college as well. Um, when I was at Masterpiece, I feel like they were really focused on what residents can do rather than the, what they can't do. We were really big into asking why not. Um, there's there's a lot of different things in, in senior living that you do, I, I guess probably in every industry that you do it because you always did it. Um, but we were really into asking why not, like why can't a resident try this or do this? Um, and I believe that my passion for um, working with older adults really came from a super close relationship with my grandparents. I've I lost both of them just this uh, this year, which has been fairly sad uh, for me, but um, I've been really close to them my whole life. Um, I love my job. I love my team. Um, I'll just share a little bit more about working at Masterpiece as well. So one of the things that we did there is we created what we called a lifestyle review. Uh, so a resident would go through and they would answer questions about their spiritual, social, physical, and intellectual um, habits, I guess. Uh, we would use that data to teach lifestyle coaching to the employees so that they could support the resident in making wellness changes in their own lives um, that helped support them in growth. And then we also used that aggregate data uh, at a community level. So we would also coach uh, the communities to make changes at the community level that would support overall wellness. Um, you know, we would talk about not all cookies and cakes are bad, um, but maybe you shouldn't have cookies and cake every time you have a meeting. Um, so I, I, I love what I did there and we're not right into uh, building a, any signature programs right yet, but we are on our way um, to do that because I wanna build some of what I had done in my previous life into this, this role. Um, I'm, I'm newly married, I got married last May. Uh, we actually just bought our first house. So I'm living out of boxes right now. It just happened over the weekend. Um, and right before we got married, we did a half Ironman together. I would never, ever suggest working full-time training for a race and planning a wedding at the same time. So if you have anything to learn from me, please don't do that. Uh, and we have a very spoiled dog named Kelsey. So. Thank you so much, Amanda. And actually, congratulations on all these things. Yeah, thank you. I'm doing all the things. <laughs> That's quite amazing. Uh, before we get the conversation started, just as, as a reminder to everyone uh, for the chat, just make sure that the uh, the drop down that you're selecting is with everyone so that everyone can see your contribution. Not because by default, sometimes it's on hosts and panelists. So, uh, so anyway, so thanks both for your uh, your great uh, introductions. It's uh, it's always nice to to hear more about people's background you know, how they fall or they enter this industry, this amazing industry, I think we'll all agree. And also uh, what, what keeps us here, really this passion. So, you know, it's nice to hear from both of you, given your experience of gravitating towards this role where you're now supporting so many, um, you know, individual buildings, uh, so many team members. And in the end, when you think about it, you're really touching the lives of thousands of people. So I don't want to paint a dramatic picture, but in the end, there, there is a need in your position to, Amanda, like what you were saying, to build programs to help support all of that magic, right? All of that uh, engagement and work and so on. So I know we're going to touch on this throughout the conversation, but, you know, briefly, Amanda, I'd love to hear from you, your experience with these signature programs. Right. And one, maybe if I can just to start the conversation, many professionals here are the people that are receiving this program. In, the, in other words, they are uh, supported by you or somebody like you. And so, yeah, I'd love, love to hear your experience with these. 
Well, um, you know, I, I kind of, I walked in, I think like anyone would into a position where there were certain things that they had in place. Um, so I think we have a vision for some new programs. We're not quite there yet um, for Morning Point. It, it, I'll mention just again, um, having worked at Masterpiece Living, it's so confusing because they both are MP. So I have to like switch back and forth. And sometimes I, I forget which one I'm talking about. Um, but in working for Masterpiece Living, one of the things we did all the time was create um, signature programs relating to some need based on health, right? So we had a program called Vertical that was specifically um, designed to work with residents on you know, um, avoiding falls. And, and learning exercises and fall risk and that type of thing. Um, we had one called nourish. So we tried to keep them one short, short little word. Um, and that would focus on, um, you know, just making healthier choices for eating. Um, but that lifestyle review that I talked about, a lot of times people would not know where to start with making an impact um, on, a, on the community level. So we would create programs that they could they could use. Um, and so I think, you know, with Morning Point, we would like to eventually get there. Um, I, I'm um, working right now on just wellness, right? So our owner came to me and said, you know, we want to, we want to focus on wellness, but that's, that's, there's a lot of things that you can cover with wellness, right? So I, you know, you have to kind of pick where you're going to start. And I think what I had come to the realization is that really what I need to do is create a framework um, that each individual community can operate within. So um, we have rural communities and we have communities right in the middle of a city and we have little tiny communities and we have big communities. Um, so we want to offer wellness opportunities, but we want to make sure that it's really just a, a framework so that they can have some awesome successes based on um, all of the logistics that make them them. So Thanks, did that answer your question? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, yes. And and just starting with the framework is helpful. And, and the fact that there's many strings you can pull for sure. I think everyone would, uh, would agree on that. Janine, I know you have also have a lot of experience with that. And with the wellness framework, initial thoughts on that? Yes. I mean, like we just rolled out last month, our senior living enrichment program. And so now we have our senior living, our memory care and our SNF engagement all on the same program, which we have ours based in the domains of wellness, like many people do. Um, and I just find that to be such a great thing. Kind of what Amanda said, where, you know, I've tried it the ways and some of you at ASC may be laughing where we really try to tell you exactly what to do and exactly how to do it and do this this time. And, you know, that is definitely not my favorite way. I don't think that's the most successful way. Um, I don't think that motivates people. And I don't think it honors kind of what we all know, which is that everyone is so different and everyone has unique needs. And so, you know, giving that domains of wellness, you give people the framework that you know is key to all human beings, no matter whether they're young, they're old, they're our age. Um, and it really allows for people to have a meaningful experience, but allows everyone as life enrichment professionals to use their expertise to, you know, be creative and, you know, have some freedom themselves to have those differences between their residents and between their communities. Thanks, Jenny. I know as we were preparing, we, uh, and this is kind of later when we talk about standards, but we talked about this analogy of a um, of a snowflake you know like all snowflake are completely different just because of nature itself but if in the end snowflake a snowflake is a snowflake so it has the same structure so i think uh, that's often a good way of, of looking at it but you know in your um in your position it's part of your position and responsibility to have that vision right and you started alluding both to some of these challenges that we might have um, and sometimes it's just challenges of just the nature of the industry, like these places, these people obviously are all different. But let's talk a little bit about current challenges that you see right now with this kind of high level view that you have across your communities. I'd love to hear, you know, Jenny, starting with you, what are the things that you see are actually, you know, talk, talk about challenges, good or bad, like things that strikes you out as we are mid-April 2024? Well, I don't think you could probably talk about healthcare right now without talking about the 
challenge of staffing. You know, yeah. I do think that that is just a reality of, you know, where we are. And I think, you know, one thing that is, I think, discouraging to people who are life enrichment professionals is, you know, when we think of our clinical staffing, it's almost mm -hmm. like the food, water, shelter of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Like those are the basic needs that have to be met. And, you know, life enrichment can sometimes get pushed to the side because we're dealing with these, this really significant crisis. So, you know, I think that's a real challenge. Um, out of that challenge, I think there has been some really good things that have happened. You know, I know there's several of our communities that have, you know, kind of added more life enrichment professionals um, because they know what an impact those folks make even when we have challenges with staffing on clinical. So I think that has been kind of a silver lining um, to staffing. Uh, and then the other challenge that I think might resonate with several people um, outside of staffing is just this increase in mental health needs that we're seeing in healthcare. You know, we're seeing people with really unique and acute mental health concerns. And it really affects our approach to life enrichment and how we can give programming and meaning to those folks. Mm -hmm. um, it requires us to be much more educated. So I think that is another very unique challenge. That I think will only continue to grow, you know, as we move forward in time. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, Janine, just on this, when you look at when you look at mental health, do you see this uh, across the um, the quote unquote product types? Do you see this across like assisted living, memory care, and skilled, or is it one one or one one area in, in specific? I think it cross cuts across all three, mm -hmm. um, and I think part of it is we as a society, I think, have a much better recognition about mental health, and I think yep. it's less stigmatizing to say I you know I am struggling. Um, I also think we've elevated, you know, some of our own expectations about, you know, trauma informed care and being aware of all those kind of things. But I do think this is something that it cross cuts across all areas. I think it is most difficult to deal with probably in memory care, you know, yeah. where people don't have as much insight, can't kind of get, describe what they're feeling as acutely and those kind of things. But I, I see it across all three. And I'm curious, just because I know it's one of your big, big, big uh, focus is, uh, you know, the reduction of antipsychotics and all of these measures and so on. Do you think that your work kind of drilling down into these have had an impact on that as well? I sure do. You know, I think that that was kind of an answer to, that wasn't effective you know, in a lot of cases, certainly in some people, they need those kind of medications. But I think in a lot of people, there was an expression of a behavior or even a mental health concern, and they were given those medications to kind of tamp that down. And then when you peel that away, you really are just dealing with the root cause of the problem. Um, and we definitely have much better ways. I think we know many more things than when I started 25 years ago, you know, about people about behavior, about what drives people, um, and have many more tools than we did years ago when it felt like the only answer was drugs. And we certainly are in a better place now. Yeah. And like you said, quite a few times already, but, and, and it's worth repeating every single time, just knowing the resins better, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Amanda, I'm, I'd love, to, I, I know your organization is, is, uh, and I think we, we talked about this kind of different than than Janine's and and uh, yeah, I'd love to hear what you see, good and bad. Sure, um, I was just I was thinking about the challenges and I was laughing because um, you know I worked on a really small team at Masterpiece. We had maybe eight people, and I feel like you'd be shamed if you brought something unhealthy to the office, right? And so I move across the the country. And I'm in Chattanooga, you know, and th there's this traditional Southern food and people are eating fried chicken and uh, it's Valentine's Day and there's candy everywhere, everywhere I look. So I felt like um, just strictly thinking about wellness. I, you know, I almost had my own little culture shock um, just moving into this, this new world where, you know, I want to focus on wellness and it's like, we could even make some pretty small changes and have a pretty big impact um, there at the community. I think, uh, like Janine said, staffing, I mean, it's it's challenge everywhere. I mean, it's not yeah. just our industry, it's, it's across all industries. Um, so th that's also a challenge. Um, I had mentioned standards and I don't really remember um, necessarily what I, what I had been referring to when I was talking about standards, but I will say, you know, 
um, we have a certain set of standards. We hold people pretty um, accountable to them. So, you know, I visit communities at least twice a year to make sure that they're staying accountable to what we've had. But we have, you know, standards and we have policies and then we have processes and then we have the way that sometimes people do things. And I think, um, you know, we're we're pretty good at our company of providing the same resources at every um, community. So I know that every community has a TV that rotates when they're walking in and every community, um, all of the life enrichment directors and uh, the memory care directors, which we call the intern program directors, they all, each one has an iPad, right? So that they can um, take attendance at, at activities or um, use it for the different resources. But then like there's all those less tangible pieces, you know, like these policies where it's like someone tells someone that this is the way we do things. Uh, and, and I think that's where I feel a lot of challenge just as I'm sort of kind of wade through when I'm new is um, just really learning how to best train people, especially with the type of turnover that we have. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously one of the things that we hear so often is that, you know, you might have a good culture in a, in a building, but in the end, we know, especially in life enrichment, we can't do the job alone. You know, no one can be engaging, you know, 100 residents, 60 residents, even 30 residents for one person is tough. So the minute you have too much turnover, then you get literally no help from other mm -hmm. departments. And that's a big, uh, that's a big issue. Yeah, you know, we, we have fairly small communities, too. So I do feel like we some of my teams are getting pulled into things like cooking food you know if there's there's turnover in that position or, or whatever it is and yeah. um, I I feel like it's such a shame so definitely a challenge <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah no, absolutely but um I mean for whatever it's worth you know in France they, they also have staffing turnover but I, I overall say that that was a bad joke well exactly I, I don't know if it's a bad joke but the point is that staffing is definitely an issue uh quote unquote almost worldwide but it seems things seem to be improving and um, and uh, and really, the culture seems to be driving most of the buffering mm -hmm. aspect of it. Um, but in the end, we also need these standards, like you discuss, Amanda. And um, you know, Janine, I know that you at uh, at ASC, you've put a lot in of work in these programs and uh, and the tools that you've um, you've created or updated for your. Uh, for your programs. Do you mind sharing a little bit more about these as well? Sure. I mean, we operate with standards, um, you know, part of that framework and, you know, give people a certain number, you know, of each domain of wellness, like our most prevalent is, is physical wellness. Amanda, it sounds like you would like that one, but I just think that's a domain that really has no, no drawback. You know, it helps physically, it helps with behaviors, helps with mood, you know, there's all of these benefits to it. And yet if without those standards, I will say before we put those into place, it was probably one of the least um, offered programs on people's calendar, because yeah. if you put exercise class up there, Charles, you probably go. Sounds like a man might go, but I wouldn't go. Um, so, you know, we have to be creative in saying, if you do something three times a day, you're not going to put exercise class up there. You're going to, you know, talk about some different things. So that is one of our big standards that, you know, we have in place. You know, we're fortunate to be able to use Link Senior. We put standards as far as, you know, the number of minutes. I think that's really helpful just to give people like an idea of what they, you know, should be accomplishing, I think is always helpful. I think all of us, um, operate better with a sense of goals, with a sense of standards, like what, you know, should I be accomplishing in all of our relationships and, you know, in our jobs. And so I think looking at it in that way, we really are are helping people and do them, a, you know, almost a disservice if we don't have standards. So, you know, I think those are are really important as well. Yeah, I love the thoughts. For, for anyone that is kind of wondering where to start uh, something I forgot I wanted to say a few minutes ago, but there are, there's a lot of literature obviously online to help us get started when we think about these wellness framework. One of the, one of the organizations that I think has put a, the most thoughts on it is the ICAA, which is the International Council on Active Aging. And uh, if you Google ICAA wellness, there's a lot of, um, um, I think they have a lot of resources that are free online. 
but then they had these audits and it's across the level of care, but it's really focused on aging. So that's it. That's a great way to start. It's funny you but, say that because that's actually where I decided to get started with. I took, I'm already? Fin just finishing one of their courses, leadership and wellness management. And that's where yeah. I kind of had this, I think we need to go the framework way rather than just create something that everyone's going to have to replicate across the board. Um, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's how yeah, I, I, mean, I remember. I remember when I started in the industry, I think I think ICA was one of the very first ones to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in the end, it's not it's not going to quote rocket science. It is a well-established model from the World Health Organization. But where the ICA has been has proven to be so effective is to apply it to not only aging, but also senior living. Yeah. Uh, um, and I, uh, what is it, Jenny? I think they do a great job because they talk about the why behind yeah. their programs. And I think that's sometimes where we as leaders do people in injustice because we just say, oh, I have these three activities in this domain. And then we all move on instead of really spending time saying like, why, why is this the way that we're doing it? Like, why does it even make sense? And, you know, with just rolling out our senior living, we spent a lot of time talking about that these are basic human needs that don't change throughout the course of your life. And that really is why it's the basis. But I love that organization because they really go into, you know, why this is a great framework to work under. Yeah. And actually, sorry, I get excited because yeah. we're, 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 no, no, but we're, we're, we're talking about we're, we're starting to address one of the topics that I really want to wanted us to do that to do, which is for the audience to understand were you both, um, you know, were you, were you both are trying to do and why sometimes it's difficult, right? So these models, often this vision is, is the vision. And so often there are challenges, there are kind of, uh, you know, it's where the, the tire hits the road. And I'd love, you know, both of you to explain how you think about these, because in the end, your job is not to be cops, right? Like you, no one wants to be a right. policeman chasing people around for frameworks. For, sorry, for, not frameworks, but for, um, for yeah, for standards. Thank you. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you go through that, just for the audience to understand, you know, vision, like real life and how these, you know, what's difficult and how do you think about these? You want me to go first, Amanda? You want? I'm happy I'll, to I, go first. Um, yeah, I mean, go ahead. I think I'd already mentioned this, but you know, I I acquired, you know, what the person I guess not really what the person before me had been doing because it was a new position, but mm -hmm. what the company had kind of just deemed these are the life enrichment standards, you know. Yeah. So, uh, I, sometimes I didn't even know the why behind some of those, and I will say I'm just getting to the point where I'm starting to question. Okay, why do we have this as a standard and is it is it still necessary, right? Um, the, the funny thing is sometimes I think people just love to say, oh, that's it's a state requirement, you know, and it's not necessarily. So that was one of the things like we had pet vaccines that everyone had to have um, their pet visitors. We needed pet vaccines and we learned that only one of our five states actually needed um, mm. for us to have pet vaccines. So that, you know, um, on record. Um, and so, you know, that's actually a standard that we can drop. So I think um, in terms of a of, of vision, um, uh, I guess I'll also say that, it, like Janine said, if you're not setting the goal, it's not going to happen, right? So if we don't say that this is the goal, there, there's a million things to do, you know, and, and like I said, sometimes um, the life enrichment directors are also in the kitchen or helping someone hook their cable up, you know, or whatever they get asked to do when they're out and about uh, in the community. Um, so there's plenty of time to fill your time, things to fill your time up with. And we do need to have standards in order that people, um, I guess, make the time for, for some of them. I think I'm still working on the vision, you know, I think I'm still working on, you know, I, if we can always keep in mind, like, what's the best for the residents, you know, some are going to want the exercise, but some are going to want you know, um, I'm not coming up with anything else right now, but you know, there, there's just so many different wants and needs and we want to make sure that we're catering to them. So I think when I'm thinking about being a visionary, it's probably how can we best meet the needs of the residents that we have right now? Yeah. Janina? So. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree, Amanda. I mean, I think for me, I try to learn just as much as I can, you know, about why things are the way they are, 
what other people are doing that's interesting, you know, just kind of things that are happening out there. And then I think where things get hard is how you translate all of that into something that will operate in a small community with a few people and then a large community that has a staff of 20 people. And so, I mean, I really look at my role as being a servant to, you know, our life enrichment professionals that are in the the community so that they don't have to be an expert on everything that's going on in the world. I can try to take that on for them and then give them some just practical solutions that they can still use their creativity and still use their talent um, that just kind of encompasses it. So I just kind of learn, try to learn everything but then really try to to give them something that they can operationalize, that they can understand, that they can practically use um, mm-hmm. to help their residents. I love that you say that. Um, I I am also over our memory care, but I'm I'm not. I don't have a ton of knowledge on memory care. I do we I do have a corporate director of memory care that reports to me. But I was being asked to make some pretty big decisions about RAs. So I, I went and undercover bossed the and just pretended like I was a trainee yeah. at uh, every variety of communities because I was like, how can I make a decision for this position if I really don't understand it? You know, so I do try. I I love when you said that you try to be a servant to um, to what the needs there are, and yeah, it's a great way of putting it. You know, sometimes when I. Uh... I mean, we we all know what the end goal is, right? And that's what you, Amanda, when, well, you actually, you both discussed it, which is to, you know, help our residents find purpose through their preferences, like these individualities. And, uh, you know, sometimes I look at your positions, your your roles. It's a little bit like you, you have all these team members you're supporting. And so from zero to hero, you know, regardless of where they are, your your goal is to help elevate each of them and pass at least a standard that is your own defined standard. And Amanda, actually to both of your point, it it could feel sometimes lonely if you don't have opportunities to network with other people in your roles. Um, and things are constantly evolving also, challenging. Um, but so talking about, you know, when we were preparing, when we were brainstorming, we one of the challenges we discussed was was exactly this point made earlier by diversity, right? The fact that you need to also allow for your teams on the ground for individual decision making, which is a great thing, right? But um, you know, Janine, for example, we spoke about the huge diversity you have in buildings, right? Do you wanna do you wanna share more about that and what yeah, what are what have you yeah. your views on that? No, on absolutely. That? With over, we have over 100 communities, and so they range from tiny 25 beds, I think is our smallest, to over 200. So, I mean, there's just an incredible diversity. And so, if you're familiar with the facility assessment that SNFs have to do, where they just kind of talk about the basic question is who are you taking care of and what do you need to take good care of them? We uh, changed that into a life enrichment facility assessment. So all of our professionals twice a year do an assessment on their individual residents to kind of give them some cues on things like how old people are, you know, because we think about the type, even type of music, the type of movies that we play, you know, I've got some communities that still it's very appropriate to play all that fifties music. And then some I've gone into and it's, they're playing the eighties and that is the right genre. So, I mean, it helps with that. Um, We also look at things like interests. Um, And then one thing that I think is so important to remember is how people like to be engaged. You know, Mm. everybody's heard me talk about this a lot, but if you think about our resources, when we think about life enrichment, probably 90% of our resources go into group programs. Um, And then when you look at how people really like to be engaged, 90% are not group people. Um, You know, sometimes you get into buildings where more than half of the people just kind of like to do their own thing. And then it's our job, you know, to make sure that we are providing meaningful experiences in the way that they want to be engaged, not in the way that we think that they should be engaged. So that, you know, life enrichment facility assessment kind of gives them a moment to say, oh my gosh, like 75% of my people like to do things independently. How can I make sure that I'm using my resources appropriately, you know, to make that happen for everybody? Yeah. One of the comments in the in the chat before had to do with uh, 
scheduled versus unscheduled programs. And uh, one of our past speakers at one point made a point about memory care residents. You know, a lot of them actually don't really care what happens at 10 a.m. on the calendar. It's more like when they want it, how they want it, where, they, you know, that kind of thing. And I think this is where uh, culture and, um, you know, training becomes so important. And Amanda, you, you at one point I made a point about that. I don't know if you remember, but do you mind sharing more about, about that? Oh I don't know if I remember what you're referring to. I mean, did I just come into today or? No, no, no. Just when we were preparing, we were talking about the diversity of culture and how, mm -hmm. you know, how would you help elevate that for all the different, the diversity of cultures that you have across your your communities? Yeah, um, it's still not coming to me, but I can still talk. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think, you know, when we didn't have someone in my role at the community, what would happen is someone would do something cool and we would yeah. say, oh, every community needs to do this. Um, uh, yeah. So, you know, I feel like I'll give the example because I talked about it um, last time we chatted was we have a, an event we call Seniors Got Talent. So it just started as a talent show in, a, in one of our communities. Um, and now it has kind of grown into, we use a giant historical theater um, and we do it in four different markets. So it's turned into a big thing, but I think that tended to be the pattern. Um, we just had a really great example um, one of the things uh, initiatives maybe we started about a year and a half ago is we decided we wanted to start hiring older people. So we created this position called the hospitality aid and it's a 12 hour a week position um, where we're trying to hire people over the age of 60, right? Um, mm -hmm. Generally, I know you can't discriminate based on age, but that's kind of the goal is to provide that opportunity um, in the communities. And so we have this really great situation where there's a former Morning Point employee now in this hospitality aid position, and he started this great men's group and it's thriving and it's popular. And I have a feeling that before I was here, we would have just required them to replicate this, right? But the, that community and that place and the way they do that, it works for them. And I think there's something that can be magical at another community. Um, and, and really that's, uh, that's kind of what I'm talking about. That's a really yeah. specific example of it, but, um, you know, we may have something in our Knoxville community that just really works well for them. And I think, um, in creating this framework, we just want to, you know, allow, you know, the freedom, um, for them to use their creativity and whatever the resources are that are unique to that community, um, based on what they have in order to create these really great things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you can stifle that if you don't, you know, if you have too many standards, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. And in the end, you know, regardless of how diverse or the type of diversity that we're dealing with, you know, we also talked, I mean, and again, we alluded to that, but rural versus urban and so on and so on, there needs to be this accountability aspect, you know, there needs to be some kind of reporting. And so sometimes people think of reporting as a bad thing, but there's also great things about them, right? And Janine, you had, I see you're unmuted to talk about this, but you, you had something Ooh. about, you know, celebrating these, you know, I know you have several things in place. We'd love to hear about that. Yeah. Yeah. So accountability is one of ASC's like core values. So I've had a lot of experience talking about it. And I think a lot of us, when we think of the word accountability, we think negative, we think like discipline yeah. and have to, and we think of some of those negative words. Um, but I think of accountability in this sense as really, you know, celebrating when people are doing a good job highlighting people. Um, and so at ASC, every Friday, we have a wellness spotlight. And so I give them weekly topics um, that are meant for a couple things. Like the weekly topics really are an accountability check. You know, so I say, you know, this week, we're going to talk about your favorite physical wellness program. And so that really is a way to say, I hope you have something to talk about in this area. And if you don't, <laughs> this is something you need to expand on. And, and we do get pretty challenging. So, uh, you know, at least every other month, I do something with our care companion culture about really resident mm -hmm. person centered type engagement. And you would not believe the amazing things that this group comes up with. We just did it last week. So, you know, you go from something pretty simple, like show me your favorite exercise to something more advanced like that, that really drives accountability. And then I choose kind of the 
four or five different ones that show a variety. And then I send it out to the entire company. So the home office and senior leadership and executive directors and nurses and, you know, everybody. And, you know, it really brings some great awareness to life enrichment and all the special things that they're doing. And then it's a really awesome way to end your week, you know, after it's been really challenging. Um, I have so many of our senior leaders that say Friday at four, when I send that out is a real highlight because they get to see all of the amazing work that everybody's doing. And then it is a great accountability tool for our professionals, you know, in the field as well. Yeah. Obviously celebrating goes a very long way. Uh, someone on the topic, but slightly different. Um, Amanda, you'd mentioned the, um, your ownership meeting, your standards of excellence. Do you want to discuss a little bit about that? So, well, um, you know, I guess in terms of accountability, we do, um, we're accountable to some, to uh, two owners. So like I said, we're kind of owned and operated by uh, two gentlemen that started our, our company together. Um, and they have a meeting for our senior leadership team, uh, every month. And then, um, and then the rest of the leaders, you know, on, on a quarterly basis, and they ask us a lot of tough questions. It's like, you know, not necessarily going to leave beyond the room, but um, that's where you're, you you want to come prepared for, <laughs> for that meeting. Um, you'd said, you said ownership and then also standards of excellence. So the, the standards yeah. of excellence, that's just the terminology that we used. I, I, we don't love the word audit, but it's kind of the best way you can kind of describe what it is. Um, yeah. We have a tool that we use. I'm sure a lot of companies do, but um, it lists all of our standards for our department. Um, and then the, the next tab over is the next department, you know? So mm -hmm. uh, last year I visited every community uh, twice and really just, you know, we'd take a glance, sit down and, and look at the last six months of calendars and make sure that people are following the standards that we'd identified. Um, so, so that's what, what we do. I can't imagine having a hundred communities because I would not have the capacity to go to every single one twice. I did a lot of travel this past year. Um, but I, I guess like scalability wise, that's what we do have the capacity for that right now. Um, and are able to, um, to go visit and just make sure that people are being yeah. accountable. Thanks. I think we're, I'm just checking on time. I want to make sure that we, we capture also our, our, uh, our next section. We, we, we had discussed, um, you know, what you feel are exciting things, huge opportunities, especially this year. I think that things have, have been uh, continuously improving, but it kind of feels that, although we're not out, right, there's still staffing challenges. There are many things that are blocking us, but where I see many organizations kind of really looking ahead, one, and also two, making plans about it. And so I'd love to hear, you know, maybe, maybe Jenny, starting from you, what do you see as things that are really exciting um, in your line of work? Well, I think um, I saw somebody in the chat mention this earlier, but this concept about social isolation, I think is, you know, something that we've really got to take a look at how we, you know, are assessing that and how we're dealing with that, how we're preventing it. And I think that's something that we're going to look at, um, Right now we're in a um, trial we with CMS with virtual reality mm -hmm. that had a really unexpected outcome for us. So, you know, everybody knows the virtual reality, put it on, go to a yeah. different place, exercise, do that kind of thing. But um, because this is, uh, you know, research-based, they did some interviews after people had that. And we found that 87% of the residents expressed less isolation. Mm -hmm. And so it really is an interesting concept about why that experience, you know, would, you know, make them feel less isolated. So, you know, I really looked at that. I'm speaking about it at a um, the quality summit coming up next month uh, yeah. to try to take away some of those things that we can do. And I think, you know, a lot of it comes down to that feeling of connection with something outside their four walls, the feeling of connection with another people with other people. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of exciting things there that don't necessarily mean you have to have virtual reality, but really looking at how we are making connections with other people, because that really is how you are going to prevent social isolation. So I think that's something really exciting coming up is thinking of different ways to try to deal with that problem that 
are creative and innovative and focus on connections with other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Amanda, what's uh, what's well, getting you? Um, you know, we have some things that I'd already mentioned just that are, are yearly activities um, that I always look forward to. So the Seniors Got Talent event we do in, a, in a four of our larger mar markets. So we do a, a Lexington, Knoxville, um, Nashville area and Chattanooga. Um, and anyone over the, the age of 60 can come share their talent, kind of like an American's Got Talent, except for seniors. Um, it, it's one of the funnest things that we do um, and, and we get every department involved, you know, so we um, we do sponsorships um, with our sales directors and the auditions or with the life enrichment directors. So kind of every um, department, it, it is a fundraiser and we um, we have a foundation uh, that gifts money, uh, nursing scholarships uh, to students who are wanting to become nurses because we have such a shortage in our industry. So um, that's a fun thing that we do. Uh, another thing is we always have a conference for all of our uh, life enrichment directors and memory care directors. And I'm also looking forward to that because it's just a, a month and a half away, only six weeks. So I'm kind of in the, the busy time of getting ready for it. Um, and that's something that I am looking forward to as well. But you're, you're, you're bringing them all together, right? We do. Yeah. They come, they come to where our home office is, uh, in the Chattanooga area, um, and get to spend some time in person. That's a huge, uh, undertaking. Yes. Yeah. I, th I think it's a, it's a great way to invest back in the employees and everyone comes back energized and I feel like our department one is the best, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Jen I know Janine's company also, <laughs> like you do, like you do huge events, right? Oh, yes. We, it's funny. So, Amanda, we're doing um, ASC has talent. Okay. And so we're doing a combination it. of our residents and employees to kind of just see what's out there because everyone, mm -hmm. it goes back to that. Everybody's got a talent. Everybody's got a story and it. can't wait to see what it is. But we're going to do that at our next big event, Charles, is it'll be a little talent show. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I love little, it. A huge one, you mean? <laughs> yes. Uh, a big talent show. <laughs> Yeah, before before we get wrap up, I I did want to ask you a question and just heads up, it's it's an unprepared question, so um you know apologies if you're but I'd love you know as I, as we were talking, I was thinking about um I was th thinking about really the uniqueness of your roles and I was I'm sure that sometimes there's miscommunication between all of the different departments you're working with, the teams you go and visit or you contact versus, you know, email, telephones and so on. And so I guess the question was, what would be the one thing you wished they all knew about you and what you're trying to do, right? What's the one thing that sometimes you feel a little bit, there's a disconnect between, hey, we got to do that, but I need that and so on. So you know, whoever wants to go first, I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on the, again, the one thing you wish they, they all knew about you and, and what you're trying to accomplish with your, with your company and programs. Well, I can, I can start because I think they all know this about me. Um, but I think one thing that I always tell everybody is that, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I am not perfect um, and certainly don't know everything. So, yeah. you know, I think that there's, um, there's some freedom in that. I think when I kind of first started with this, boy, did I just try to get everything right. And I was so scared to make a mistake. And, you know, now I, that I've done this for a while, you know, there's some real freedom in like, let's just try something. Let's try something. And if it doesn't work, we won't do it anymore. And we'll try something else. So, you know, and I try to make sure that all of um, our life enrichment professionals feel that way too, that you don't have to be perfect, that this all really is a big experiment, that we're all just trying to figure out the best way to do things. Um, so, I mean, I think that's really like the most important thing. And I think that, you know, everyone knows that really what we are here for is, is to honor these residents that we're privileged to take care of, to really find out about them and that it doesn't have to be you know, some big event that we throw or big parties that really just truly spending time with people and finding out who they are and what's important to them, you know, is is really what we're all here for. And the rest kind of all flows from there. I appreciate it. I appreciate um, the notion about being vulnerable. And, you know, in the end, if we're not, uh, I think what I'm hearing also is that if we're not, when we're failing, we're not trying 
hard enough, I guess, also. Exactly. Amanda, yeah, Amanda, any? Yeah, I, mean, I feel very similar to everything that you said, Janine. I guess I'd, the way I'd word it is I'm still learning too. Um, so yeah. yeah, there's a lot of a lot of times that I maybe don't make the best decision and we can try and try again. Um, and it, nothing has to be permanent. You know, we can, we can try and if it doesn't work, let's change things up. So, um, I think I, I hope I'm always on a learning journey. Um, and that's how I try to live my life. So I guess that's what I, I would say. Well, thank you. Hey, oh, I'll say one more thing really quick. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> I guess sure. also that, you know, um, that that we're we're not necessarily ever doing anything with mall intent, right? It's always with a with a good intention behind it. So I'm sure. still learning too, and I am working to do things with you know the the interest of the life enrichment directors, the interest of the the lantern pr program directors, and in the best interest of the residents, you know. So um, sometimes it doesn't always work out that way, but um, that's oh, I think I think a you good I mean, intention. Yeah, I think I think your your jobs are. I mean, there's a lot of meaning and it's purposeful and, and you're really changing the lives of thousands of people, but they're all challenging. And it's what I'm fascinated in is that m most of the time you have a just an amazing capacity to evolve and adapt. Like six months ago, your jobs were just really different than they were 18 months ago and 24 months. They were just radically different. And um, and just continuing to press on and continuing with quality programs is 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 amazing. So um as we close out, I was um, curious to ask you this question, which would be, what would be your one tip for the audience? And uh, I'd love to hear that maybe in a minute or two. Janine, you want to go ahead? I, I do. So mine really is about getting to know the residents on a truly personal level. And I would challenge everybody mm -hmm. of what that what that means. Um, because I think a lot of times when we're like, oh, we talk to people on when they admit and we find out what they like and we ask them how many kids they have, but then what happens? You know, and I think, you know, if Charles, if I did your life story the first time I met you, it would look very different than mm -hmm. how it is now, you know, that I I know so much more about you and things have changed and evolved. And so I think that that is the absolute number one thing in all of healthcare, not just life enrichment is, you know, this process of really truly knowing, you know, who a resident is. But I think so many times process wise, we have it down to, well, I talk to them on admission and I get this social history and that just isn't going to cut it for what, you know, we really need and what our purpose is. So think of how many times we should revisit that and what that should look like, I think is my number one tip. I love it, Janine. Yeah. Well, yeah. I know the last time we had this conversation, the first thing came, that came to my mind, um, I thought maybe we'd pull in somewhere else and we didn't. So I'll mention it is just thinking about um, we've been having a lot of conversations about our company is what what we're doing in life enrichment is is its own form of medicine for the residents um, yeah. that we're providing. Uh, and so just thinking about your job um, in getting to know the resident and providing for their needs in that way is is so important um you have a giant responsibility on your shoulders to um provide that type of medicine for your residents so engagement that's my yeah yeah I, but I then that. i heard you say flexible and i thought <laughs> be flexible that's a pretty good advice too <laughs> no but i i think we i mean our jobs is as important as as a, not more important but as in, as important to contribute to help elevate the the well-being of our of our residents for sure um, Amanda and Janine, thank you so much for uh, being with us. It's been a true pleasure, uh, really engaging conversation. I'm sure you saw in the chat, people are very thankful. I'm also grateful for both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ben. Yes, thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Uh, everyone, um, if you want to continue the conversation, Amanda and Janine um, are, are happy to answer questions if, if needed. Uh, thank you both again. Thanks everyone for joining. In terms of announcements, coming announcements, one thing that we kind of alluded very briefly, but we, we have an amazing webinar coming out on May 7th. A lot we can all learn from Disney. And so David Hopkins is a past executive with a, with the a Disney company. And he is going to, uh, he also, he, he got into the industry as an ED, which I think is fascinating. And so now he consults with different organizations but the webinar that he's going to be uh, uh, leading with us is called If Disney Ran Your Senior Living Experience, right? 
Um, we, in June, on June 4th, Tim Anderson, who's an activity consultant, is going to talk to us about the LGBT older adults, concerns and strategies for care and programming. And we are extremely excited about, about our largest event of the year on June 25th, which is our Activity Strong Summit. And this year, we decided to focus, because it's been a lot of feedback, we decided to focus on people living with cognitive change, with dementia like Alzheimer's and other types of dementia and other types of cognitive changes. And we took, decided to take a stand, which is to celebrate that journey. Not that we want more people to have dementia, but more that when you have dementia, that everyone understand that these, this life, these years, months, weeks, days, hours, minutes are worth living as much as anyone else's. And so hopefully you'll all get to join us on that particular day. With that, again, a final word of thanks to both Amanda and Janine and wishing everyone a, a, an amazing afternoon, morning, wherever you are. And uh, hopefully we'll talk soon. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Janine. Take mm -hmm. care. Cheers. Bye-bye.